Hello everyone and welcome to Physics 220 here at Grantham University. We're going to start our lecture seminars by talking about physics units and measurements. We study physics because it helps explain the world around us and it gives us an understanding of the physical world and how we interact with this. One of the things it also does is help us explain basic phenomena and predict them. Once we've covered some of the basics, we can move on to more complicated events. As, as you're going to see this class builds on itself over and over and over um, as the weeks go on. So next thing I want to move on to is the concept of what we call units and measurements. So I have three things here. And I, I'll ask times I ask the students, I say, what are these? We see one's 1340, one's 9.81, and the other one is minus 273.15. Well, technically, they're just numbers. They don't become important or significant to us until we add the units. So those uh, letters with combinations of powers and whatnot we have. So the first one is called 1340, and it's measured in watts per meter squared. And that's the uh, average energy we receive per square meter from the sun. Next, we have 9.81 meters per second squared, a number you become very familiar with in this class. And that's acceleration due to the Earth's gravity. And last but not least, we have minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, which is absolute zero, the coldest possible temperature. Now, the units are extraordinarily important because just because two numbers may be different doesn't mean they're not the same um, value. For example, that 270, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius is the exact same temperature as zero degrees Kelvin. Like I say here, units finish the story and tell us how we measure and work with a quantity. So now we've talked a little bit about physics and units and measurements in general, but now we want to talk about the SI unit system or the metric system. So please take a few seconds and write down some advantages of the metric system and think about this. Pause the lecture if you need to. Now write down one disadvantage and think is this something you can get over, especially in this class. What I usually find at this point is most advantages students come across are the metric system is base 10, they use a common unit with a bunch of prefixes like centi, milli, megi, mega, so on and so forth. And honestly, the point here, the only major disadvantage most students in the U.S. come across is they don't use the metric system every day like people in other parts of the world do. But let me show you a little example here that will show you how the metric system is easier. There are 100 centimeters in a meter. Also, there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. So how many centimeters are in a kilometer? Let's look at the solution. One kilometer equals 1,000 meters. So then if I write that again, one kilometer equals 1,000 meters, times my conversion between centimeters and meters, I get 100,000 centimeters. Now, as you can see, that's a pretty straightforward example, and some people can even do that without a calculator. Now, let's look at a very similar example in the English system. There are 12 inches in a foot. Also, there are 5,280 feet in a mile. So how many inches in a mile? Following the same methodology, one mile is 5,280 feet. So one mile is 5,280 feet times 12 inches per foot, which gives a number of 63,360 inches. So what I always ask my students at this point is to look at these and try to decide which one looks easier. So that's what we will do, and we will use the metric system almost exclusively in this class. So please review it and ask your instructor at any time if you have any questions. Our next topic here is dimensional analysis. So at this point, many of my students ask, what is dimensional analysis and why is it important? You guys will also come across it this week as it's a focus of the discussion question. Remember, since we are dealing with primarily with measurements and constants, we have to keep all the units here consistent. Almost every numerical value you will deal with this class has a unit associated with it. We saw this a little bit in the slides example, the difference between numbers and measurements. And the important thing here is that the units cannot just go away. When you solve your problems and your equations here, and by the way, I always wait until the very last step to put my measurement and their values in, you have to keep the units consistent. If you multiply values, you have to multiply the units. If you divide values, you divide the units. If you add or subtract, the units don't change, but everything else falls into the class that whatever operation you do to the numbers, you have to do the units also. This is important because it keeps our measurements and our calculations physically sound. And it's also a really good tool because it can help you find mistakes. The main point being is if your units are not correct and you have done what you believe to be the correct operation, there is no way the problem is correct. Now, if they are correct, you never know 100% for sure, 
but at least gives you an idea that you're on the right path. So continue on with dimensional analysis. We'll go over a couple more topics and ideas here. Now it can get more complicated, but this is the basic idea. There's two ways to deal with dimensional analysis and measurements when you do calculations. First is in addition and subtraction, you must have the same physical quantity and they must be the same units. Meaning you can only add a mass to a mass, for example, a time to a time, a distance to a distance. You can't add a mass to a distance and get anything reasonable and physical out of it. Also, once you have them, they have to be in the same unit. If you're adding two masses, they both have to be in grams. If you're adding two times, they both have to be in years, so on and so forth. And once you have done that, then you will be able to do the calculation and you leave the unit alone. Here's an example. If I'm adding two centimeters to 1.1 meters, you have to convert one unit to the other. Or basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the 1.1 meters to centimeters. So I get two centimeters plus 110 centimeters, which gives 112 centimeters. Notice they're both physically distances. I converted them both to the same units, and the units were unchanged in the final part of the problem. Now, multiplication and division, like the one we saw on the previous slide, the units follow the same algebra as the numbers. Here's an example. If I have a measurement of 36 meters squared per second squared, and I square root the entire answer, I square root both the number and the units, so that the final answer will be 6 meters per second. Again, like I talked about in the other slide, if you divide measurements, you divide the units, and so on and so forth. Next up we have kinematics, or we can finally get to some physics now that we've got a lot of the requisites out of the way. So there are three basic properties of motion, and they are all actually connected. They are displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Remember, these are vector quantities, not scalars. And vectors are physical quantities that have magnitude and direction. So technically, displacement is a certain distance in a certain direction. Velocity is a certain speed in a certain direction. And acceleration is an acceleration in a certain direction. They are related, as we're going to see in the upcoming slide. And they are almost always described as x for displacement, v for velocity, and a for acceleration. Continue with kinematics, we look at some of our definitions of our values. First, we see that the average velocity is the change in displacement over the change in time. That little triangle is the Greek letter delta, and it means change in. Next, we have the average acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. So let's do a quick example. If a car travels at a velocity 8 meters per second, then stops in 4 seconds, what was its acceleration? Also, how far does it travel once it starts braking before it stops? Now, I'm actually going to take a sidestep in a second in the next slide and talk about how we solve problems in general. So before we move on to the nitty-gritty of the problem and how we actually solve it, I want to go over a problem-solving method. I wanted to review a good problem-solving technique, so remember when we work on any problem in this class to start with these four simple steps. First one is, what do you have? The view of the problem would look at what facts, numbers, units, etc. you were given. This sometimes can have hidden information. For example, in the previous problem we talked about a car coming to a stop. That means the final velocity is zero. Even though they don't come out and say it, you have to be able to pull that information out of the problem. The second problem is what do you want? Look at what the problem is asking for. Sometimes with all the formulas and numbers flying around, one can lose track of what the question is asking. A nice little trick I do is whenever I figure out what they're asking for, say for, um, in another problem I was looking for mass, I would write mass equals and then a question mark at the top. So then when I have all my initial values, I can always go back and look, well, what am I looking for at this point? Plus, many times you don't sit down and do all the problems or even all of one problem in one sitting. You may stop, take a break, go to work, do whatever. You may forget what you were looking for and have to reread the problem numerous times, whereas if you just had it written down somewhere, it's a little easier to work with. Step three is I call what you do. This is where you bring it all together. You manipulate the formula form or formulas and plug in the data to get the final answers. So this is once you've algebraically manipulated everything, have your expression solved for it, then you can plug in the values and get an answer. The last step is check your work. This is more than just plugging the answers back in and checking that your answers mathematically fit. You also need to see if the answer makes sense physically. If something seems wrong, try it again specifically if you've seen some errors in the units. If you continue to have any concerns, send your instructor an email about the problems, and we can talk about this during office hours. So now let's get back to our problem. So the first thing we need to do is identify all the variables and find out what we want. 
So what are they? Well, the variables are initial velocity, final velocity, and time. And we want the change in position and the average acceleration. So we see that the change in velocity is given as final minus initial. Using the definition of acceleration, we get A average equals delta V over delta T, or A average equals 0 meters per second minus 8 meters per second divided by 4 seconds. Remember, the problem never explicitly said the final velocity was 0 meters per second, but it did state the car stopped. So our answer is negative 2 meters per second squared. Notice the negative sign. This means the car was decelerating or slowing down. A positive or negative sign for an acceleration physically means something. Now we have to work on how to find the distance. The only equation we have to work with is this one. The average velocity is the change in distance over the change in time. But we do not have the average velocity. But we can get this using our knowledge of averages, and that is it's the final plus the initial over 2. Or it's 8 meters per second plus 0 meters per second over 2 gives 4 meters per second. Next, we rewrite the average velocity to equation to look like this. All we do is multiply both sides by delta t. So delta x equals v average times delta t. And this gives delta x is 4 meters per second times 4 seconds. Notice the seconds cancels, again, keeping our units consistent. And we get 16 meters. If you have any questions, please remember to email your professor at the end of the week. This is the end of the lectures for this week. I hope you've learned a lot, and have a great week.